Today, inshallah, as you're aware, because of what's happening in the world, what I'm doing the last few weeks, I'm talking about interesting episodes in Islamic history that we can take inspiration from. And some of them are more relevant to exactly what's going on. Others, we can derive some generic benefits. So today is going to be one of the most bizarre historic incidents in our ummah that I am pretty sure almost none of you have heard of because it's a very obscure footnote and not much research has been done in this reality. And this is a slave revolt in this part of the world around 150 years ago. In fact, it is the largest slave revolt against the uh, whites that dominated them. Why are we discussing this in the masjid? You will be shocked to hear this. This slave revolt was the largest slave revolt in American history, and it was a Muslim revolt. It was Muslim slaves using Islamic motifs and wearing Quran and wearing Islamic garb and trying to gain their freedoms after having been unsuccessfully, after having been enslaved and brought to these lands, then they're coming together and attempting to revolt and gain their freedom. And this is the, the, known as the Bahia Slave Revolt. Now, where did it take place? In the Americas, but not USA. And that's why many of us are not aware of it. It actually took place in Salvador, uh, which is the province of Bahia in Brazil. It took place in Brazil, in the Americas, and it took place in the 1830s. And it's a very interesting episode, and I'm going to summarize what we know, and I'm going to, uh, inshallah ta'ala, encourage us to look up more about this regard. Just a quick understanding of what's going on here. You all know that the slave trade uh, consisted of ensnaring and capturing freed people in Africa's and bringing them to the Americas. Now for reasons, you know, each one is different, for reasons that, you know, just pro probably coincidental, the slave trade of Brazil in particular had a large percentage of Muslims coming into it. So Brazil had the highest concentration of Muslim slaves in the entire continent of America. There's no other, and especially this province of Bahia. And it just so happened the Portuguese were in charge because Brazil, you know, is the Portuguese protector, right? The only country in the world that speaks Portuguese is Portugal and Brazil, basically, right? There's some smaller groups, but basically that. So the Portuguese are in charge, and the Portuguese are a small group of people. And they're just importing slaves and, you know, workers and whatnot. Eventually... 80% of the people of the land are slaves or freed slaves. Only 20% are the local Portuguese. And of these 80%, probably 30-40%, we're not sure 100%, are Muslim. In other words, a good percentage are Muslim. And these Muslims are from uh, the Yoruba uh, uh, tribe and also the uh, Nago tribe. So there are tribes in Africa. They're primarily from these regions and the, the Muslim slaves of Brazil were so common there is a term that is used in Portuguese to indicate a Brazilian slave and that is Male and Male is the Yoruba term for a Muslim Male is what the Yoruba people called a Muslim in the Brazilian or in the Portuguese language it referred to Muslim slaves now what do we know about this era in the 1800s the Muslims began speaking of revolt and freedom and some of them were waging what they themselves call jihad. This is a very unknown history. Jihad is being waged in the Americas, in this part of the world. And what a legitimate jihad. These are freed people captured in Africa, brought against their will months and months, you know, in the, uh, in the ship, and then made to work worse than animals. And of course, this is completely unjust, as we know, completely unfair. In the 1800s, we know of at least five attempts led by Muslims in Brazil to overthrow the masters. Each one of them was small, maybe 50, maybe 100, and each one of them ended in a failure. There was one particular famous one, uh, a sheikh by the name of Sheikh Ja'o, Sheikh Ja'o in 1815. Uh, it was a, he was the Quran teacher, half of the Quran, and he uh, led uh, 60 slaves in a rebellion against the Portuguese. He managed to kill 14 Portuguese soldiers and achieve freedom for a period of time until finally the Portuguese came and massacred all of them. So we have five documented uh, uh, Muslim revolts against the uh, Bahia Portuguese. The most important and the last one and the largest one, and this is the largest slave revolt in the entire Americas, 
Nothing came close in this country. Nothing came close in this country. Even though the quantity of slaves was more here, but the quantity of Muslims was more there. And it, you needed the courage of Islam. And you needed iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam gives you a sense of dignity and a sense of courage that nothing else will give you. We see this in Gaza now. Islam gives you the, the incentive to fight for your rights that no other religion will give you. And we should not be ashamed of this legitimate fight. It is so unfair, so inhumane to take a human being and put him in slavery and make him a slave and treat him worse than an animal. He has every right to fight back and we should not be embarrassed about this. So of course, there was actual jihad going on in Brazil and then the biggest revolt I'm going to talk about today, it took place in 1835. This was the biggest, the largest, and the last revolt because it had repercussions we're going to talk about. So this revolt is called the Bahia Muslim Slave Revolt. That's the title of it. The Bahia is the province Muslim because it's led by Muslims, Islamic motifs, using Quran, slave revolt of 1835. What happened? And again, the problem is one of the reasons why we don't have research written is that the people that were in charge were killed, they didn't leave records for us. We are piecing together based upon the enemies, based upon the Portuguese, based upon the court records. We are piecing together what happened based upon outsider accounts. Unfortunately, unless we discover some hidden journal, some hidden diary, we don't have eyewitnesses from within the movement. So we have to kind of sort of make a lot of assumptions. So what we know is that this talk of rebellion was rampant amongst the Muslims. They're not going to remain this way. Five rebellions have taken place from 1800 to 1835. And a number of travelers that have gone through this region uh, of Salvador, you can look at up Salvador, which is a city in Brazil. Salvador and the province is Bahia, it's the tip of Brazil. Salvador, a number of travelers that have gone through from 1800 to 1835, they document an amazing phenomenon. They document that slaves are praying. Slaves have Jumu'ah. Slaves are fasting Ramadan. There are madrasas for the slaves. There's no other place in the Americas that I'm aware of. Yes, there were hidden, you know, slaves writing Qurans and hidden slaves in America passing down. In Bahia, in Salvador, because the slave Muslims were so many, there were schools in neighborhoods where slave children were taught Quran. And there were shuyukh that were enslaved. Because, you know, they just catch anybody there. They'll catch somebody, turns out to be a sheikh and alim, and they make him a slave as well. There were bona fide ulama and scholars who were in Brazil. And they had founded madrasas as slaves. Some of them secret, some of them open secret. None of them legal. It's not allowed. You're a slave. Sometimes the master is lenient, and you can do it. And sometimes, you know, the master, you have to do it behind his back. And we know this because we have copies of the Quran manuscripts written down. We know this because one white traveler went through Salvador and he mentions he came across a madrasa in which the children were being taught. He was amazed by it. He wrote it down on chalkboards and then they would wipe the Quran away and memorize it again. This is how African brothers and sisters memorize the Quran. They write it down on a chalkboard. They wipe it away. They write it down again. They wipe it away. They were doing this in Brazil. They were using a, a, a slab and some writing and they would have the children write it down. So this white guy comes through, he's shocked. What type of technique is this? This is the technique used to this day in West Africa, in Nigeria, in Benin, and all of these lands. He saw this happening in uh, Brazil. Another traveler goes through and he happened to be there in Ramadan. And he mentions that on their holy festival, they sacrificed goats and, and lambs and they distributed. So they're actually celebrating Eid as slaves in Brazil. It's unbelievable. So the quantity is, is, is a lot. We don't know exactly how many, but like I said, probably 20% of the slaves are Muslim. Now, what we do know, around this time, there was one particular sheikh who was highly respected. We know his name only, Sheikh Bilal. That's all we know, Sheikh Bilal. He had a Portuguese name in the documents in the Portugal uh, registrar. He is known as Pacifico Lisutan. Pacifico Lisutan. They so they gave Muslims Portuguese names, right? So every person has to be given Portuguese names. So in Wikipedia, he's listed as Pacifico Lisutikan. You can look him up. But his name is Sheikh Bilal. So they're forcing these names on the people. Now we know the Sheikh Bilal was the one who was giving Eid and Jumu'ah as a slave. And his master was particularly cruel because his slave was respected by all the other slaves. Whenever the Sheikh Bilal would be walking in the streets, the other slaves would say, call him Malim Malim, which is the African term Mu'allim. 
I, I, you say sheikh. In Africa, it, the, the term sheikh is not common. Ma'alim is common. Ma'alim means mu'allim. So the, they would call him Ma'alim Abu uh, uh, Bilal. Ma'alim Bilal. Wherever he would walk, he would be given a lot of respect. We don't know his biography. We can assume he was an actual sheikh and alim, and he had been caught, and now he's trapped over here, and the slaves give him an immense amount of respect. His ma in fact, what is truly amazing, the slaves raised funds over the course of 10 years to try to free him. And they gave the master the price that was typically given to slaves, and the master out of spite refused. They did it again after five years, and the master still refused. When I read this story, what truly shocked me, slaves are fundraising to free another slave. Slaves are not fundraising for themselves. They're fundraising for the sheikh that they love, and they want him to be freed. And the master refused because, again, just spite in this regard. The master dies, and he's in debt. We know his name, his biography. He's in debt. The laws of Portugal, who goes to jail? His wife, his children? No, the slaves go to jail. These are the laws. No white person is going to go to jail for their crimes. So who goes to jail? The slaves are put in jail because the master doesn't have money to pay his debts. And then the court rules the slaves will be auctioned to the highest bidder. And, you know, Ma'alim Abu Bakr, Ma'alim Bilal is going to be given to the highest bidder. This appears to be the catalyst that caused the slaves of Bahia to now say we have to revolt on a massive scale. The love they had for a scholar, the love they had for the sheikh was so much, this was the catalyst that now we have to do once and for all a final stand. This is not, we're not going to let our sheikh be sold into another province. Another place. Enough is enough. And so plans began. Now, the researchers that have researched this, they have assumed, legitimately so, that this plan could not have been enacted in one week. Rather, the plan was for years, but the, the, the arrest of uh, Bilal, the arrest of Sheikh Bilal was the catalyst because it's impossible that this entire strategy could be done in a few weeks. And so the arrest of Sheikh Bilal uh, was the catalyst and they decided on the 25th of January, 1835. That is almost 200 years ago. 25th of January, 1835 is going to be the day. What was special about this day? Two things happening on that day. One on the Christian side, one on the Muslim side. As for the Christian side, 25th of January for the Portuguese in Brazil was a holy day and a festival. 25th of January was a vacation. Everybody's going to be partying and getting drunk and whatnot, so the guard will be down. And it coincided with Laylatul Qadr of Ramadan. The 25th of January, 1835, coincided with Laylatul Qadr. And so they said, on Laylatul Qadr, they're going to have the holiday, we're going to have ibadah. They're going to get drunk, we're going to be praying to Hajjud. And we are going to, once and for all, just revolt and get rid of the Portuguese. Now, uh, as we said, so uh, a little bit of a background here. In this province, very interesting, there were a lot of freed slaves as well. And there were probably 20% whites, 80% blacks. Of the 80% blacks, more than half were freed slaves. So uh, Brazil was a little bit more open in this regard for freeing slaves in America. So more than half were freed slaves. What was the plan? The plan was that they would overpower the prison and the small uh, contingent of guards. They would free uh, Sheikh Bilal and then they would call publicly for all the slaves to join them and the freed slaves because the freed slaves know what slavery is like against the 20% of the population. They cannot go public to the 80%. That's going to give their plot away. There's a small group of people. The goal is to be the catalyst. The goal is to light the fuse and to show them that, hey, we have done this. We have gotten rid of one fortress, one contingent. Now we need the rest of the population to rise up and overthrow the 20%. We are more than them. We're 80%. We can get rid of them. And the Muslims took the charge in this. However, Allah's qadr, this is, يعني, we have to accept it. They were betrayed. Who betrayed them? The story goes that there was a Christian lady who uh, had divorced from her Muslim husband and she came to discuss some issue, monetary, whatever it might be, and she paid an unexpected visit to her ex-husband who is a part of the elite or the guards in this and she overheard them discussing the plan. She wasn't supposed to be there. She's outside. Now she sees all of these slaves together. She overhears them discussing the plan for the next day. Immediately, she alerts the authorities. The authorities were already troubled for the last 30 years. They know the Muslims 
are not going to be peaceful in this regard. So within a few hours, this ex-Christian slave lady, her report goes straight to the governor himself. Within a few hours, which is very rare, this report all the way goes here, and the governor immediately sends into action a plan. What is the plan? Nobody has vacation tomorrow. Actually, we bring in extra troops. And this prison where the Sheikh Bilal is, they were going to station hidden troops inside. They're not going to be aware of them. And all the, other, uh, all the other slave owners, they are told the next morning, do not give any holiday to your slaves. Keep them busy in the field because there's no technology. There's no WhatsApp. The, most of the slaves have no idea what's going on the goal was they're going to be holiday and the news will spread come join us they will leave the plantation join the the revolt and the majority will be with the muslims so the command came out slave owners keep your slaves busy today do not give them any vacation guards no vacation and extra guards in the prison so the Muslims did not know this, and so they did, in fact, attack the, uh, the, the, the prison, thinking they would free Sheikh Bilal. When they came to the prison, they were surprised by a, a, an entire cavalry of forces, and so they had to retreat to the Muslim quarters, and what followed was an entire day long of back and forth and skirmishes. Over 500 slaves were active in the revolt. Now, 500 is a massive number back in the day when there's no WhatsApp, no Telegram, no nothing. To have 500 people sworn to secrecy, to have 500 people leading a charge, there probably would have been 30 people guarding. They would have easily overcome that. They would have then used that as a catalyst to get more and more people. The goal was to get the entire population, but the cavalry was set in. And so for an entire day and night, there was vicious battle back and forth, but you have an army against 500. Now, what is interesting here, we have actual clothing of the people there. We have the remnants of the people that were there. All of them were wearing Quranic talismans. They had written Ayatul Kursi. They had written Surah Falaq, Surah Nas. They had written, I actually saw one myself, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. They had written the beginning of Surah Fatah and they had put it in their pockets. They, had, they, they were thinking this is, you know, and this is jaiz to write Quran. It's, it's jaiz and this is yani, nothing a problem and they think this is going to be something. And it is a source of baraka. There's no problem here. And this is super interesting. When they launched the attack, they did not wear the clothes of the people of Brazil. They had manufactured their African Islamic garments, which is the long robe and the turbans. It's, it's just bizarre. I want you to think about this. In Brazil, in 1835, 500 people are yelling takbir, and they're wearing the Islamic garb and turbans, and they're reading Quranic verses, and they're saying, Inna fadahna laka fatham mubina, and they're jumping in, attacking the Portuguese. Wallahi, bizarre. And yet this is exactly what happened. And it was Allah's qadr. And, you know, Allah knows what would have happened even if they had one over one cell. In reality, it's ambitious, but how can you win against an entire country in this regard? But still, they didn't want to live like slaves anymore. And so, obviously, an entire day of fighting, many dozens were killed, many were captured alive. And then, of course, you can only imagine the backlash, right? You can only imagine what's going to happen. Brutal executions, brutal whippings. Some of them were whipped. I, it, uh, from the records I read here, 1,400 lashes given in public 1,400 lashes over a period of days you just keep on whipping in public one of the ladies the Muslims that was caught here may Allah yani, give them what they deserve stripped and 400 lashes in public a lady 400 lashes because you know they don't want to kill too many people why? because they're slaves in the end of the day and they want to keep the property, right? So they kill the ringleaders, they give brutal sentences to the next in command, and the bulk of them, they whip brutally and then take back into uh, slavery. And of course, eventually the, uh, the revolt is quelled. But was that the end? See, here's the point I want to bring here. You could end the story here and say, SubhanAllah, failed revolt, it didn't happen. But see, these types of, 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 of uh, enterprises, these types of um, uh, examples of courage and bravery, they actually inspire others and they lead to changes even after the death of the people who were involved. Some bizarre things happen. Of them, across the entire Americas, including USA, panic gripped the elite, especially panic against the Muslims. Moors, they would call us back then. And they realize the Moorish slaves are different category than the Christian slaves. The Moorish slaves are not going to be beaten down. 
And this actually led to, believe it or not, a reduction in bringing Muslim slaves. Can you believe one of the bizarre effects, right? Overall, we don't like slavery, and doubly, we won't like it for our Muslim brothers, and we don't like it for anybody, but doubly, obviously, for our Muslim brothers and sisters. This revolt actually resulted in a trickle-down policy don't, don't take these people, they're going to they're gonna be problematic, subhanAllah. Another effect that happened here is that eventually the governor of Brazil, they, they cracked down brutally, as I said, they punished, and then eventually in a year, he sent out a decree. Anybody who's sympathetic to that revolt, get rid of him. So over 500 Muslims were discovered because it, it was illegal to be Muslim. They shut down the madrasa, shut down the masjids, and... Muslims went into hiding, just like in Andalusia, this happened in Brazil. 500 Muslims were discovered. How were they discovered? Tasbih, prayer caps, copies of the Quran, you know, spot checks, anything like this. And guess what was happening to those Muslims? They were, of course, you know, put into jail, but not. Then they were sent back to Africa. Now, that's actually a positive. Being a slave, they sent them back to Africa. And Interestingly enough, they kind of gain their freedoms. This group of people, this 500, their descendants are still known because some elements of Portuguese culture and language remain in them. You know, uh, there was one thing that, again, so much to be said here. You have to realize what I'm talking about here, the Portuguese Muslims in Brazil, this wasn't one generation. This was three generations. And da'wah is being given. And one of the things that was discovered by the Portuguese police, many of the people who revolted were not born Muslim. They had embraced Islam. And what this means, and this is unbelievable, slaves were giving da'wah to other slaves while they're slaves. And slaves were converting to Islam from paganism, because you know the, there's animism, there's paganism in Africa. So most of the tribes that came were these paganistic. They weren't Christians, because you know from Africa, there weren't any Christians. So uh, they, they're, they're bringing in these animist tribes, these tribes that have paganistic beliefs. The Muslims, as slaves, are giving them da'wah. So the Portuguese discovered a good percentage of the re rebellers were not even born Muslim, but they had embraced Islam. And this shows us, even as slaves, they were giving da'wah. So 500 people were sent back to Africa, obviously they were, you know, hit and beat and put in jail, but eventually they were sent freed after having been slaves. So the end result, interestingly enough, 500 people got their freedom, even though that wasn't the point. The point was just to get, to get rid of them. Another interesting point is that even though 500 were expelled, still some Muslims remained secret and hidden. And in 1900, we have a number of visitors who recorded practices we now know as Islamic, meaning up until 1900, 100 something years ago, there were still secret Muslims in Brazil. Obviously, they are no longer that generation. They're completely destroyed. But in Brazil, we had more Muslims than in uh, America. And the final point I want to mention here, and this is probably the most important one for the, what is going on in the world today. And that is, when this incident occurred, the people almost universally viewed it with one lens. And that is the lens, these are rebels, these are evil people, these are you know, terrorists, whatever it might be. In a similar time frame, by the way, a, a rebellion occurred here in Virginia, much smaller, not 500, but 50, 60 people. It is the rebellion of Nat Turner. Nat Turner. Every single child of yours who goes to middle and high school knows Nat Turner. It is in the curriculum of every American history textbook, the rebellion of Nat Turner. Much smaller, uh, around 60, 70 people participated, and it was in Virginia around the same time. It can't be causally related because it's too far away. Roughly the same year, a year or two apart, Nat Turner rebelled in Virginia. And he gathered together in the name of Christianity, not Muslim. He gathered together around 60 slaves. They rebelled. They killed their owners and their families. They killed women and children, by the way. They killed because in the end of the day, they want their freedom. And anybody there, they're going to be a problem for them. So they killed every white person they found, 50, 60 people. Obviously, what's going to happen this country went into panic mode, literally panic mode. The president, the governors, the senators, everybody went into panic mode. They sent in the army, militias, mobs came in, and hundreds of black people were lynched unfairly. Not just the people. As for Nat Turner, he was flayed alive. They made, I'm not even joking here, they made bags and purses out of his skin. To, to make an example of him. They cut him up, they tortured him to death. Obviously, they captured him after a few months and whatnot. And they tortured him and his followers. And then the mob mentality began. What is the mob mentality? Any 
black person whom they thought might be, they just killed him on the spot. Lynching. Hundreds of people were lynched because of Nat Turner, because of the fear. What if this guy might attack? What if this guy? And at the time, go read the New York Times. New York Times is operating. Go read the Virginia Quarterly. Go read any newspaper. The sympathies are all with the white folks. There is not a single positive. How can Nat Turner be described as a hero? Nat Turner is given the worst adjectives, just like the Bahia Revolt in Brazil. But then, subhanAllah, now when you read Nat Turner, when your kids read Nat Turner in high school, go ask your high school children who have taken American history, have you heard of Nat Turner? Nat Turner is considered a legend, a hero, the first slave who revolted for independence and freedom, the first slave who fought for his freedom and dignity. And all of a sudden, there's no adjective of terrorism, there's no adjective of evil. Everybody has to acknowledge when you are a slave, you have the right to fight back for your freedom. When you're treated worse than an animal, don't be surprised when you're going to fight back and for your rights, you're going to do things that it's not good. Nobody's justifying what Nat Turner did. But how can you ignore the context that Nat Turner was in? How can you ignore you were the guys who made him a slave? You were the guys who treated him for 40 years like an animal, whipping, beating, no life to live. When he revolts and when he attacks back, it is fully understood. You understand exactly where I'm heading with this? right now we know Nat Turner was the hero and his slave owners were evil vile cruel inhumane people at the time who could have said this nobody but this is the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I want to give good news and good tidings glad tidings to our youth here that eventually truth always separates from falsehood eventually real courage and real values and real morality will always rise up so do not be swayed by the rhetoric of the media do not be confused by the brainwashing of those who have no morality think long term fight for the truth stand on the side of justice always be with the oppressed against the oppressor and eventually not just in the akhirah of course in the akhirah but even in in this dunya, the oppressed will always be the victor and the hero. Even in this dunya, the oppressor will always live in ignominy and infamy. And people will always despise zulm and injustice. It just takes time, sisters and brothers. It just takes time. Do not lose hope. Do not falter. Aim high. Be with those who are oppressed against the oppressor. And realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always sift truth from falsehood. Allah will separate the khabith from the tayyib you be from the tayyib you support the pure you are with the pure and Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you because of that Jazakumullahu khayran Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <laughs> ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إليك